You yep. start. Yes. Hello, my name is Steve London from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm a recently retired corporate and securities lawyer, having practiced, having practiced for the past 20 years. I'm also national co-chair of Jewish National Fund USA Lawyers for Israel. Before we begin our program today, we'd like to take a moment of silence to remember those who have been murdered and injured and to share our support, thoughts and prayers for those being held hostage and those who are fighting for the land of Israel. Thank you. We'd like to welcome the Honorable Mayor Elbaz Starinsky, Israeli Council General in Miami, who has joined us today. On behalf of Jewish National Fund Lawyers for Israel, I want to express our deep appreciation to each of you in our community for your continued support and commitment to the land and people of Israel. This November 30 to December 3rd, please join us for the Jewish National Fund USA Global Conference for Israel in Denver. It's critical that we stand together in support of Israel. Please join us and details may be found at jnf.org backslash NC. As a member of Lawyers for Israel, 
Jewish National Fund has an online national attorney referral directory in which you can upload your firm's practice areas and contact information. This is a wonderful resource and the directory also allows you to connect with like-minded pro-Israel attorneys throughout the country. I know from personal experience, this enabled me to connect with attorneys outside of my state of Massachusetts to refer work to their firm. You'll receive the link via email tomorrow after this program and being added to the directory is one of the benefits of joining our Lawyers for Israel Society. Hello, my name is Ellen Lawson and I'm an attorney in Scottsdale, Arizona. If you have not contributed to our emergency resilience campaign, I ask that you do so today. Jewish National Fund has been doing incredible work. They have evacuated 14,000 Israeli residents from Gaza border communities to safer places. The entire area surrounding Gaza has become a closed military zone. JNF is supporting families that have been evacuated from 28 communities in the north near the Lebanese border. JNF is providing evacuees with necessary supplies such as bedding, toiletries, and clothing. They are providing firefighting and protective equipment for civil defense. The first responders to community emergencies, including radios, bulletproof vests, helmets, and tactical clothing. They are providing high quality psychological treatment for civilians, including children who have experienced this catastrophic catastrophic situation firsthand. They are providing respite activities for the children traumatized by terror. JNF is going from home to home in the cities of Sterot, Afakim, and Arad to help the elderly, the infirm, the needy with food and medicine. They're caring for children whose parents are on the Avda Air Force Base in the Negev, so parents can continue their vital work protecting our homeland. And JNF is promising to rebuild communities devastated by these attacks. With an annual minimum donation of $1,800, you will be a member of Jewish National Funds USA Lawyers for Israel. Your donation will go towards JNF's emergency resilience campaign. Every dollar you give will go directly to Israel. We truly need your donations now. Thank you. I'd like to now turn the program over to Maya Aaron, partner at Mark Migdalen Hayden in Miami. Thank you, Ellen. Today's presentation will be based on two blocks. Block one, the legal side management of the case that led to a $1 billion settlement in less than one year. And block two, the human side. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A section that can be found at the bottom of your screen. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. Michael A. Hansman, former Florida Circuit Court Judge, is senior counsel at Bilson Sumberg, Sumberg's Litigation Group, where he focuses his practice on alternative dispute resolution. Judge Hansman also employs his extensive experience and legal acumen to strategize and consult on trial and appellate matters. Judge Hansman served as a circuit court judge for the 11th Judicial Circuit of Florida for 12 years, building on his decades long success as a commercial litigator in private practice. As a circuit court judge and appellate judge by designation, Judge Hansman authored more than 200 published legal opinions and orders during his tenure and served in the complex business division where he dealt with Miami-Dade County's most complex business cases, including the historic $1.1 billion settlement in the Surfside condo collapse case, which we will discuss today. Judge Hansman also served in the Juvenile Dependency Division, where he made a tremendous positive impact in the lives of young people. I had the pleasure of practicing in front of Judge Hansman in the Complex Business Division. Judge Hansman has a brilliant legal mind, 
but more importantly, he's an amazing human being. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Judge Hansman. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, Maya, thank you so much for that uh, very nice introduction. It is a, uh, a pleasure and uh, honor to speak with you today, and I want to thank you for organizing this uh, program. I'm very uh, honored to work with JNF, which I've come to learn a little bit about over the last few weeks, uh, an organization that has done so much to promote Jewish culture in Israel. And of course, I'm very sorry uh, that we have to be here uh, under such uh, dire circumstances being faced by the Jewish people, both in Israel and, and elsewhere. And, uh, and I appreciate so much the efforts that your organization makes to help those in need. And um, I will be joining uh, the organization and, uh, and look forward to working with you all in the future. Uh, thank, you thank you again, again. Judge Hansman, for joining, joining us, us, sharing some sharing time some with, us, with us, and especially, especially uh, sharing some of your thoughts about the, about the case, case and its and impact, impact on you. On you. Um, as as my intention, we're, we're going to break this uh, discussion, discussion into two parts. parts. First, the, First, the legal the side, side of the case, the and then second, the, second uh, the more the human more side. side. And, uh, the, impact the impact on, on involved, involved, in, including yourself. So, uh, maybe to maybe set the set stage, the stage. Um, can we give us a little, give us a little bit, of bit of a layout, layout of the case? Of the case. Um, who brought the case? What were the claims against who? Um, just so that people who we think are all familiar with the, the, the collapse of the building, the building and the, and the human impact, impact, but lay out the layout legal, legal format. Well, there were uh, the collapse occurred at 1:22 in the morning on June 24th of 2021. That same day, the first lawsuits were filed. L literally, the day of the collapse, the first lawsuit uh, was a putative class action, meaning it was brought on behalf of everybody who suffered any kind of injury, economic, uh, personal injury, wrongful death arising out of the collapse. And there were also a number of other cases that shortly followed over the next few days. Some also putative class actions and others simply brought by uh, victims' families or homeowners. Uh, the lawsuits were, were fast and furious. So basically on the plaintiff side of these multiple cases, you had uh, those who had lost their condominiums and their belongings, whether they were owners or tenants, uh, and families of people who had been uh, killed in the tragedy. There were also some personal injury claims of the few, uh, three people who suffered uh, personal injuries but were rescued. As far as the defendants in the case, they were, of course, you know, the Condominium Association, uh, which uh, had alleged liability. There were some developers who had built buildings next door uh, that claimed to have contributed to the loss. There was some engineering firms, some uh, consulting firms. There was a, a law firm, a number of professionals that had been involved with the condo association over the years. Unfortunately, because of the age of the building, it was 40 years old at the time, um, the developers were long gone. Any of the entities that were involved in the initial design were long gone, statutes of repose had, had passed. So uh, there, there were some identifiable claims, but, but not many. There was some insurance coverage that the Condominium Association had, although it was woefully short of what was going to be needed to compensate all of these victims. And that's how the case initially got started um, right after the collapse. So you know, it was a very difficult time, obviously. Uh, the, the rescue teams were still in there, um, including uh, the Israeli forces who had come over to assist in the rescue effort. Uh, emotions were high, nerves were very raw. Um, you know, many, many people 
and the community and the press were critical of, the, of, of how fast these lawsuits were filed. But once they were filed, you know, we, we as a judiciary have an obligation to deal with them. And this one needed some, I, I, I would say that it needed immediate attention was, would be a gross understatement. So things got off to a very, very quick start. And, and how was the case assigned to you? I think, I think we have you on mute, so, so bear with us for a moment. Okay, okay. can you hear me now? Yes, okay. yes. All right, and your question was again, Steve, I'm sorry? How did the case did get the case assigned, get assigned, to, assigned you? to you? Blind filing. So um, in Dade County, we have blind filings. At that time, I was in the commercial complex commercial division. There were only two judges. So the first filed case, the first putative class action was randomly assigned to my division. Uh, just a brief just a note brief for note the audience. audience. I, I realize that we're having a feedback, feedback, problem. feedback problem. And so uh, be patient with us, we're working on it and we may slow down the, uh, the conversation just a bit so that we avoid that kind of feedback. Um, Given the, the speed at which the lawsuits were filed and the public pressure that was intense surrounding the entire scenario, how did this case move along so fast? Okay. Um, so it took a lot for this case to move as quickly as it did. Um, once the case was filed, I knew from the very beginning that that we had to we had to get some things in place or it was going to go off the rails really fast. There were a, a, probably ten or fifteen different cases. There were different contingencies that were not necessarily aligned. A lot of different lawyers involved. So organization in this case was critical, and it couldn't wait months. It, it couldn't wait weeks. It had to be done right away. So. Uh, the first thing we did to move the case along is I had a status conference, I think two or three days after the case was filed. And the first problem that I saw was that we had a dysfunctional board of directors. And I don't mean dysfunctional in the sense that anybody was incompetent, but people had lost friends. I think one or two board members had uh, perished in the collapse. So the board was just not able to function. And the board was a really necessary participant because it was the insured under various policies that had to be given notice. It was going to make various decisions involving the land and other aspects of the project that remain standing. And so we had to deal with the fact that the board uh, was really kind of uh, absent. So the first thing I did is I asked the board at the very first status conference to step aside. Now that was that was a bit of a risky move because the lawyers here know that as judges, we typically just deal with motions that are brought before us. We don't make suggestions. We're, we're typically not that proactive. But but I but I knew the lawyers that were involved and I knew they would be receptive. So I took a little bit of a risk and I and I spoke to the board and asked them if they would consider stepping aside so I could put somebody independent and neutral in there that had the resources to, to hit the ground running. And uh, they took it under advisement for a day. I scheduled a hearing the very next day and they came back and told me that they thought it was a good idea that they stepped aside and they consented to me appointing Mr. Goldberg. So within a week or so or less, I had Mr. Goldberg appointed as a receiver in the case, which was a which was a critical, uh, critical aspect to get things uh, to get things moving along fast. Um, I also knew that unless I appointed a leadership structure and kind of corralled all these different cases there would be a real possibility that things would splinter in different directions and I would lose control over the case. So working with the chief judge of the circuit, we, we quickly got all the cases transferred to my division so they'd be coordinated. And I held a status conference, I think it was one week out, where I invited all the lawyers to appear and we talked about a structure. Um, I made it clear to them that there was gonna be one primary case and that the rest of the actions were going to be stayed and that the case would travel in a consolidated fashion. And I solicited those lawyers who wanted to take a leadership role to file an application. 
and proposed to me a leadership structure. So getting getting a leadership structure in case in these cases is critical. And the earlier you can do it, the, the better off you are. Um, this was a case where a lot of lawyers stepped up. I said it in multiple written orders. Uh, I commended them many times because I made it very clear at the beginning that there'd be no assurance of any payment in this case. We had an extremely unusual circumstance. I pretty much asked the lawyers to commit to working pro bono uh, because it did not look at that time as though there'd be anywhere near enough uh, potential recovery. It looked like it was gonna be a very, what we call a limited fund case which is we had a couple insurance policies. They totaled about $48 million at the time. Uh, we had the land, which was going to be a resource available to the victims. And then we had a few claims against relatively, I'm not going to call them minor players, but relatively you know, limited entities that had limited coverage. So my guess was that in the best case scenario, this might be a $100 to $200 million recovery at the end of the day. I knew the victim's losses were going to be... In, in excess of a billion dollars between the value of the condominiums. We already knew there were 98 or 99 people missing at the time. Uh, this was going to be a recovery that was going to eclipse what I thought was the amount available. So I asked the lawyers to step up pro bono. I gave them a night to think about it. I called a hearing the very next day and to affirm each one of them or most of them, I shouldn't say everyone, agreed to step in uh, to this very difficult arena and litigate this case with no assurance of compensation. So by July 16th, we had a leadership structure in place. We had Mr. Tropin and, and I appointed Rachel first as co-lead. And we had, we had I, I knew there were gonna be allocation and disputes between the various contingencies. I knew that there would be likely disputes between the condominium owners who survived and the families of the wrongful death victims. So we had a structure in place where I appointed lead counsel and then under them, we had counsel for what we call the economic class, which were people that suffered only economic loss. And then we had counsel for uh, people that we characterize as the personal injury wrongful death subclass, which are people who uh, lost their lives and, uh, and suffered injury. So we had some overlapping classes. We had counsel for each one. Uh, the other cases were stayed. Um, so we would travel under one complaint and the organizational structure was in place within a couple of weeks of the collapse. And uh, and I think that was critical to putting the case on the right path, because if you don't get an organizational structure in place early in something like this, it's going to go off in a, in a lot of different directions. And uh, nothing nothing good was going to come of that. So the, the, the initial organizational structure was, in my view, uh, critical, getting Mr. Goldberg and getting the right lawyers appointed and doing it doing it quickly and shutting down what I'll call all these tag along cases that were filed afterwards. Um, so if, if I understand you correctly, Judge, the, the need for speed and your motivation for speed was primarily to avoid parallel cases, different plaintiffs suing different defendants all at the same time with the potential for absolute chaos. Is that, is that, is that? Is that your, your under, is that the correct way of thinking about it? About it. For the yeah, need for that it, to be. Well, that, that was part of it, Steve. For some reason, I just keep getting muted every time you're speaking. So I, I'm sorry for the delay. Um, it was twofold. It was that. It was to it was to avoid what would, would certainly have been chaos. But equally importantly, it was to try to get the case moving quickly because delay was going to be uh, just more anguish, more suffering uh, for these victims, both, both emotionally and economically. I mean, for example, uh, once I got the structure in place, and I think even before I got the structure in place, I was able to authorized the receiver to make some temporary assistance payments to people who had been displaced so we could get them into rental units, um, get them, you know, new belongings, you know, basic furnishings, basic household goods and things of that nature. So it was really twofold. It was number one to prevent what I'll call judicial chaos and litigation chaos, but also getting it organized was important so I could issue some rulings that would help victims and we could start getting these issues defined and, and moving the case toward a conclusion. Because the faster you start, the faster you're going to finish. 
Yeah, I think the reason for it, yeah, you're on mute now so I can talk without having the feedback. Um, and, and these are a couple of questions that are coming from our participants, um, but I will I will kind of uh, adapt them to, to this flow of conversation. Um, you had mentioned that you appointed the receiver to replace the board of directors. The board of directors was a defendant, as I understand it. Um, what what did you um, how did you decide who the receiver should be? Um, Mr. Goldberg, what was his background um, as one question? And then uh, unrelated to that, but from our audience, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the lawyers who represented the plaintiffs? Were they from big firms, small firms, local, national? Give us a little flavor for that, if you don't mind. Okay, so as to Mr. Goldberg, um, you know, I, I practiced complex litigation for about 25 years before I went on the bench. I had worked with Mr. Goldberg in, as a receiver uh, in other cases. I knew I knew of his reputation in large cases. I knew how skilled he was, uh, how tenacious he is, um, and, and how he has the people skills that I knew were going to be necessary here. This was probably the most delicate difficult receivership imaginable. Uh, most receiverships don't involve wrongful death and personal injury claims. They mostly arise in financial fraud cases, business collapses, you know, that you think of Enron, you think of Madoff, you think of, you know, the typical South Florida Ponzi scheme. This was going to involve economic loss, wrongful death, very high emotions, disputes between various types of plaintiffs, and I knew that it was going to take a really, really nuanced hand to deal with this. And I also knew that there were, it would have to be a receiver that had a firm with significant resources. The receiver was going to have to marshal assets, locate, locate insurance, uh, make demands, negotiate the sale of the real estate, terminate the condominium, which was a Herculean task. That This was going to be a huge undertaking. So I, I did not have the option, for example, of appointing a receiver from a small uh, boutique firm, I had to I had to have a receiver that had significant uh, resources uh, at his or her disposal, and Michael Goldberg fit the bill both in terms of experience and competence. His personality was right for this case. Um, I knew he would leave no stone unturned, and he would take care of the needs of the victims. And I knew his firm had the backing to to uh, to do the job. As far as counsel's concerned, they were from all, you know, it, this was another very interesting aspect of this case because you had lawyers who were personal injury lawyers who don't typically participate in class actions. Very rarely do you see a personal injury case mm -hmm. in a class action setting. There are some in the products area. Um, you know, you think you, you think about some of the some of the product cases and the drug cases and things like that, but but wrongful death type cases involving tragedies. Uh, yes, you have airline situations, but those are typically joinders. They're not even really class actions for the most part. So you had, a, you had a personal injury bar down here that was very, very skilled. Lawyers like Stuart Grossman, Judd Rosen, um, you know, there were the, the Pothurst firm, a number of the top personal injury firms. But then you also had lawyers that deal with the economic class actions like the Tropin firm and Adam Moskowitz and Gonzalo Dorda and others. And then you had, we also had lawyers from elsewhere in the country that specialized, um, you know, in, in collapse cases. Um, so it was, it was probably, I think we, I think I, my leadership structure had 12 firms, some, most of which were local South Florida firms, but a few of which uh, were from out of state. Um, that had that had a lot of experience in in building destruction and collapse cases, but they were they were all lawyers who we vetted. I, I knew they were all experienced. I knew they all had the resources to commit to the case, and most importantly, uh, every one of them agreed to proceed under my uh, insistent structure, which is no guarantee of any payment, and to take whatever reasonable fee the court decided at the end of the case, with no, with no assurance of any compensation. And they all stepped up and proceeded on that basis. Uh, have you ever done that before in in uh, on the bench where you've told um, the lawyers uh, you're not going to get paid? Like, did you, did you have some precedent for that, or is that um, 
just um, the peculiarities, the uniqueness of this case. And and would you would you did you ask the de defendant lawyers the same thing? All right. The answer to the first question is no. I had never done that before because I never faced what I consider to be such an extraordinary circumstance. Secondly, in class actions, fees are always court approved. Uh, this was going to proceed on a class basis, at least at the time. That's what we thought and hoped for. And, and, and what I had to guide me was the manual of uh, complex litigation, the federal manual of complex litigation, which talks about a court's ability to kind of set a fee structure at the outset. And some courts find that to be advisable. So everybody going in knows what the deal is, right? Um, I didn't want a feeding frenzy here. And I knew that if I didn't have all the lawyers on the same page, I was going to have a big problem because the personal injury lawyers were going to want to go on a percentage, 30, 40%. The class action lawyers were going to want to go under class action law, which gives them a percentage of recovery. Um, there's all kinds of complicated fee uh, issues, particularly in state court class actions. And I knew if I didn't get everybody on the same page on the fee, I was going to have lawyers uh, that would not, that possibly would not, I shouldn't say would not, but might be tempted to row the boat in a different direction. Okay. And I needed everybody rowing in the same direction. And the only way that I thought that that was going to happen is if I had everybody similarly incentivized to get the best recovery as soon as possible and not necessarily try to break their people out so they could get a 30 to 40 percent contingent fee under a private contract. So I thought it was very important to lock the lawyers into the fee proposal that I wanted and to get their commitments at the beginning of the case so that everybody would be you know, again, rowing in the same direction. And I think absent that, it would have been a big problem. Can you, can you give us a little bit of, of the process where you went from this earlier stage of the litigation to, you know, creating the leadership role, appointing a receiver, how, how did it move so quickly to a settlement and the apportionment of the settlement funds. Okay, so first thing is, is I, I set a very fast schedule. I issued a scheduling order that I told the lawyers was somewhat immutable. And I set the case for trial. Initially, um, I had set the case for trial I think the case came in and we had it set in in March. So I set it about nine months, 10 months after the case came in. Um, we then had hearings because some of the defendants complained they wouldn't have enough time for discovery. So we actually had evidentiary hearings because, you know, their position was the experts couldn't be ready and here's why. So we had evidentiary hearings to determine, you know, how fast everybody could be ready for trial. And after hearing from all the experts, I backed the trial up. I think it was set for September of 2022, which was 13 months or 14 months or so after the collapse. Uh, I granted virtually no extensions of time uh, once in a while. Uh, motions to dismiss had to be briefed according to the complex business schedule without extension. I had 45 hearings in the first nine months of the case. Uh, no motion was ever pending for more than a, a week or so before it was ruled on. I entered countless written orders in the case. So it was just move, move, move. Uh, delay was not going to be tolerated. And everybody knew that going in. Uh, back to your last question, by the way, you asked me if I if I limited the defense lawyer's fees. No, I I had no authority to do that or, you know, but what I did do with the defense lawyers early is I made them give me a budget of what their fees would be because I wanted to make sure their clients were aware of that because there would be settlement opportunities. So I wanted to put some pressure on everybody to spend that money uh, resolving the case as opposed to paying fees. But no, I can't limit defense fees. Getting back to your questions of, of, of how quick it moved, um, it was just sheer will. I mean, I was not going to let the case be, be dragged out. Uh, the lawyers knew they were going to have to cooperate. They did. They dropped everything. The lawyers on both sides of the V worked 24-7 on this case. 
And then, uh, and then we took on some, some issues that were threshold issues that needed to be decided, uh, that I thought needed to be decided for the case to have any chance of, of getting resolved. And the first one was the very difficult uh, allocation issue between the economic loss people and the people who suffered personal injury and wrongful death. And then finally, I, I recruited Bruce Greer uh, to mediate the case, who in my view, he's, he's outstanding. Um, he didn't want to do it, but he eventually agreed after I after I uh, groveled with him incessantly. Um, he agreed to come in and take on the case pro bono, and he literally spent six months in ongoing discussions and mediations with the defendants and some additional parties that had been identified but not formally named in the complaint. And by the following uh, by the following May, uh, the whole case was resolved. In what's your sense? Of, were, were there certain lead defendants that really kind of took charge of that side of it? And if so, could you uh, tell us a little bit about them? Well, uh, the lead defendants, the defendants were, were coordinated as they require to be. But, you know, unlike the plaintiffs group that had slightly different interests, I mean, you had two different really significant interests on the plaintiff side. You had people who had just suffered economic loss, and then you had people who suffered loss of life and personal injury. And there was a lot of acrimony and finger pointing between those two groups. And that was probably the most difficult part of the case. And I can talk about that later. On the defense side, uh, they had varying interests. There were different types of claims, different types of discovery that were gonna be needed to defend those claims. So I can't really say there was anybody who took the lead, but on the on the construction ends of the case and on the coordination and settlement, I have to give a lot of credit to Michael Thomas and Matt Gorson and the people at Greenberg Troy, who represented the developer who built the buildings next door. Uh, they took a lot of the lead on, on the defense side to the extent there were common issues. And then there were also a number of lawyers that represented insurance carriers for these various defendants and other parties that might have liability that were also intimately involved. So, you know, as a court, I appoint the plaintiff side. I set up the leadership structure on the plaintiff side, and I, and I have control over the plaintiff's fees. But I, I don't have that same hands-on on the defense side. So they, they coordinated internally, and, uh, and they, they, were, they were outstanding. They, their, their legal work was second to none, and they, uh, you know, they, they really did a, a magnificent job in the case for their clients. Um, I, I think, given our timing, I'd like to move to a, a slightly different perspective of the case, and, and that's that's the, the human side, um, both with respect to the victims and their families, but also on you personally. Um, I can't imagine the intensity, uh, the scrutiny, the pressure that you were under from day one, um, care to comment a little bit about um, how that impacted you, your family, life for you for the duration of this case? Yeah, it was um, it was a very difficult time period for me. Um, but obviously far more so for these families. You know, I, I uh, at the very beginning of the case, I thought it was really important. And some people, some people criticized it, but I thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, from the very first hearing, I developed a pattern of opening the floor uh, so I could hear from victims directly. Uh, this was a case where not all the victims were directly represented, at least at the outset. Many of them were just putative named class members. Who didn't have their own lawyers, they they showed up for hearings as you would expect, and uh, and and I thought from the very beginning it was really important uh, for them to be heard and to feel that they're being heard. So one of the things I did, which made the case a little bit more difficult for me emotionally, was kind of interact with these victims um, from the outset, and 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 you know I I heard from people who 
who came up to me and told me about their sons and daughters who were missing and their grandkids and their grandparents. And it was just, it was just horrible. Um, you know, the pressure of the case being under a microscope, you know, it was, it was, it was difficult, but you know, it was, you know, the very beginning of the case, you know, I had a lot of death threats. I wouldn't allow people to go in and get pets um, when they were going to, they were going to demolish the building. I remember having a hearing at the night of July 4th and a woman wanted to go in and retrieve her cat. And, you know, after that, I got a slew of death threats and had, you know, 24 hour security for a while, um, you know, hate mail, things like that. Um, I think there was one article you know, posted that I was the most hated person in America at the time or something ridiculous. But, but, you know, being under that public scrutiny was, was difficult, but, but what I, what I really wanted to make sure is that I didn't let it um, deter me from, from making what I would consider to be kind of risky and aggressive decisions that I knew were necessary for the case. So that was a difficult balance. You know, um, I really, you know, I, I had other cases, but I had to devote so much time to this case. Like I said, you know, issued a number of orders. The pleadings were extensive. We had forty plus hearings. So, um, and and when you when you have hearings and you have the victims come in over and over again, you kind of get to know them and what they're what they're going through and the suffering they're going through. And people who had to relocate and lost all their possessions, and people who's you know at the very beginning were, were were holding on to some hope that their loved ones might be found. I mean, it was a very very traumatic beginning. Um, and then of course we had the big allocation fight that I had to get involved in and, and people were upset about that because, you know, a lot of the people who lost family members thought the condo owners should get nothing and should be wiped out. The condo owners felt that they really weren't at fault and they should get the full value of their units. And there was that, that kind of acrimony, but the hardest part by far, uh, the hardest part by far was the allocation process at the, at the end of the case. But Yes, it took a lot out of me. Um, I, I still, there's no question in my mind that I still have um, trauma from the case. You know, you, you see things, you see medical reports, you see photographs, you see, um, you see images uh, that you, you know, you can't, you can't erase. And, uh, and, you know, during the case, I would have difficulty sleeping. I would wake up middle of the night multiple times. It's it slowed down a little bit now. Um, but it's, but, you know, every once in a while, you know, I'll, I'll have that, that recollection and, or something will trigger it. Um, and it's, 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 it's very traumatic. I'll, I will definitely not be the same after, after that case. At, at, at one point you decided to meet with every family of the victims, um, what motivated you to do that and what impact did that have on you? Um, and, and then there, these are two kind of big picture questions, but then it, to me, it must have been very, very difficult for you to, um, the right word not isn't to side with the victims and the victims' families, but to be compassionate with them but at the same time being a disinterested trier of fact and law to make sure that if there is another side, the defense side um, has been heard as well. So, and so the two different questions, maybe you can comment on both of those. Well, for yes, the, the allocation, uh, was the most difficult emotional part of the case. So I had initially consulted with a number of people, including Ken Feinberg, who had done the 9-11 fund, and some other people who had been involved in mass casualties. And the suggestion was pretty much uniformly, don't do it yourself. Um, either come up with some formulas or grids based upon the age of the person, uh, their occupation, come up with kind of mathematical formulas for valuing each claim. Uh, or appoint special masters uh, to meet with the families and make recommendations to me. And I initially appointed two special masters and was going to, going to kind of like delegate that. But the more I thought about it, the more I knew that whatever they recommended, somebody would object or multiple people would object. 
uh, then I'd have to review it anyway. And then if I if I sustained one objection and thought somebody was overpaid or underpaid, then I would have to decide, well, where is it going to come from or where is it going to go? So it's one of those things that if you disrupted one piece of the puzzle, the whole thing would collapse. So instead of going through that process, which I knew would be very long, very cumbersome, um, I decided to kind of take it on myself and meet with every family member because, you know, one, I thought they deserved that. I, I thought the families deserved an opportunity to be heard um, and tell tell the court about their loss and their loved ones and how it's affected them and 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 make a make a presentation. Um, I thought it I, I thought it was it was it was warranted and deserved. And uh, and number two, I, I knew that if I did it any other way, it was just going to be cumbersome, slow, and it would delay people getting their funds. So. I made the decision to do it. I recruited a, a dear friend of mine, a former judge here, John Colby, and I set aside five weeks to meet with the families. Now, you know, to answer your question about balancing the defense side, there really was no defense side at that point. I had, you know, about $1.2 billion to divvy up. And, and the, the issue was, how does it get allocated amongst the victims? The defendants had no stake in it at that point. They weren't getting any money back. So... What I did is I, I required the lawyers to give me a good faith estimate of what they thought this, their case was worth and had it been tried to a jury and give me some authority, some legal authority as to as to the basis for those estimates, right? And I had that going in. And then I would have a profile on the family. There'd be photographs. I would get like uh, written presentations from the lawyers uh, with, with, with documentary evidence, medical records, photographs tax returns if the, if the people were working. Uh, we, we then had the hearings and I allocated about three hours to each one. You know, I, I, the only way I can describe it is it, it's if you went to a horrible, three or four horrible funerals a day for five weeks straight. I mean, that's that's what it was. You would see just one, one horrible case and then you think that's gotta be the worst. And then you take the binders home for the next day so after doing that for the day, I'd go home with the binders and I'd spend the night reading those and it would be worse than the day before. It was just, it was trauma upon trauma upon trauma. Um, but, you know, we tried to be objective. We tried to look at the, the age of the victim, the circumstance of the victim, who the survivors were, um, you know, but it, but it's it's an art, it's not a science. And we did our best to, to make fair allocations uh, based upon the circumstances and to treat people in similarly situated circumstances, similarly, you know, uh, there was all no two cases are the same, no two people are alike. Um, and then there were a lot of sub issues. You know, one of the things that was amazing to me about the case is these people were at their worst time. Uh, but I also saw, I also saw some real, real empathy and humanity. I had a number of victims, for example, that, you know, there are a lot of people that, that suffered significant loss but under Florida law, we're not entitled to compensation because they were not statutory survivors. Stepchildren, for example, um, are not statutory survivors. Parents are not statutory survivors if the person lost was married. Uh, so there were a lot of people who suffered significant losses. Adult children uh, are not statutory survivors under most circumstances. So uh, and what I saw is people wanting to give money to people who weren't entitled. I, you know, I had I had a daughter-in-law whose mother-in-law was in her mid-50s. It was her only son. He was 26. He was lost. Uh, she was a surviving wife because she happened to be out that night with some girlfriends, at, at, you know, and, uh, and spending the night out. And she asked me to give half of her award to her mother-in-law. And when I say half of her award, I'm not talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars. I'm talking about you know, significant, significant amount of money. Uh, I had siblings ask that their step siblings who weren't entitled share in their recovery. I mean, I had, I, I saw, I saw the best of people at the worst of times, but it was, it was, you know, I thought it was important to give people the opportunity to be heard. I think they appreciated it. You know, there was a lot of emotion in the room. Obviously people came in with videos of their weddings, the bar mitzvahs, the quinceas, you know, it was it was a brutal, brutal five weeks. But I think most people um, wanted to be heard. Most people felt it was kind of cathartic. Uh, they got to talk to me about their loss, about their loved ones. 
Um, and they didn't do it in a way of advocating. You know, it was really not judge, I'm entitled to X millions because it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of presentation. It was, it was kind of like, I want, I want you to know about my son. I want you to know about my daughter, my, my father, my grandparents. Um, you know, people had lost entire families. So it was, it was more cathartic. It was more just telling us about who these people were and how significant this lo their loss was. Uh, a question from our audience that I think is important. At, at the outset, you mentioned with respect to the settlement that there was something like $100 million worth of insurance, but the ultimate settlement was in the billion dollar range. Where did, where did the money come from? So we had the insurance money, we had the sale of the land, we had a number of defendants that were initially sued, and then the largest, the largest amount of money, almost half the settlement fund came from a, a security company uh, that never was never was sued. Um, they settled pre-suit, but that was about a half a billion dollars from a from a, a company that provides security to high rises and what had happened in this case is they had a security system in there uh they employed the woman at the front desk that night who was his frantic and hysterical trying to get people out of the building and warn them and um and what she wasn't told and she hadn't been trained apparently was that she had a you know a, an alarm button that she had access to that if she had sounded uh, would have would have sent a blaring, you know, get out of the building type alarm warning that could have been that could have been triggered, I think, 11 minutes before the collapse. So um, she gave a very compelling uh, deposition uh, where she and and uh, and some other people in her company kind of acknowledged that she said she didn't know this was there. She had never been trained on it. Had she been aware of it? You know, she would have obviously used it and people would have gotten out of the building. And she was an extremely compelling, distraught witness. And uh, half of the half of the approximately one billion plus settlement uh, came from the insurance carriers of that defendant. Well, I think we're starting to run out of time, um, but come back on, on you personally again is uh, you're now retired uh, from the bench. Um, was was your reason for retirement the impact that this had on you? And, and how are you um, healing yourself from this ordeal? Um, yeah, there's no question my retirement from the bench was in part um, precipitated by this. I needed, I needed a break. Um, I just couldn't, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I wasn't a hundred percent after it. So have I retired? I haven't really retired. I'm here. Right. Um, but I, I definitely have a, a, a more subdued schedule, right. I'm trying to, you know, uh, with the help of others, I'm trying to, you know, get the case behind me, do some things to just, uh, de-stress, um, and spend some time, you know, doing activities that kind of are calming. Uh, practicing a little law, but not much, very selective and doing a lot of mediations and arbitrations and ADR. Um, whether I'll try to go back on the court is still in my mind. It's an, it's an open issue. I loved it. You know, I love being a judge, but I knew for my own emotional well-being, I needed to step back at least for a little while. So um, because, you know, when you're there, you have to be giving it 100 percent and paying attention. And, you know, I, I wasn't. Uh, after that case, you know, I did it for a few months, six months or so, but I realized that, you know, I needed, I needed to step down for a little bit and just kind of clear my head. Well, Judge, um, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you are sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I, I will say that what, what really struck me is you are, you are seeing the humanity of people in the face of horrendous circumstances 
And given what has gone on and is going on in Israel, uh, being able to point to the humanity amidst uh, devastation is um, somewhat soothing, uh, although victims and their families can never be truly soothed. And, and to close, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna read one comment from one of our uh, attendees who I think captures everything and our appreciation to you. And the comment says, Hansman, great judge, American hero, lawyers for Israel hero. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, everybody, for for attending and, and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you. I think it's a wonderful organization that I look forward to participating in, and I hope uh, I hope uh, you've gained some insights into the case. I know it's a short discussion for a case that had so many twists and turns, um, but like I said, it was it was a black swan. Um, I, I hope no judge ever sees one like it again. Um, you know, it was it was just uh, it was devastation. But but like you said, you know what I what I also saw was some of the best, uh, most empathetic, caring and and generous people, um, even though they were in their worst time of need. So um, it was it was quite an experience, uh, a, definitely a life changing experience, and one that uh, one that will stay with me uh, for the for the rest of my time. So. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to be with all of you. It was very meaningful to me, and I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Judge Hansman, for your amazing expertise and insights on this important topic. We are so grateful for all your of your work and your service. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Judge Hansman, on behalf of all of us from Jewish National Fund USA, in appreciation for your leadership and commitment to the Jewish people and the state of Israel, it is my honor to present to you with this plaque with the phrase Shoftim Veshotrim from Deuteronomy 1618, which is a commandment for the nation of Israel to appoint judges. This phrase has been inscribed in a Torah atop Masada in Israel and is now a sacred part of history. In your honor. All attorneys attending our CLE program today will receive an email tomorrow with a link to your CLE attendance certificate. Please note that we cannot guarantee CLE credits in all states. Please support our work in Israel at this critical time. Thank you very much.